Vinnie Politan, thank you for joining us tonight here on Closing Arguments. And yeah, he's back in court, back in court today. Alec Murdoch, this guy, now this video isn't from today. I just want to let you know, because he was in a federal courtroom and because of our Supreme Court, and don't get me started, there's no cameras in federal court. But he was there, trust me, he was there. And we were talking about him last week because of this controversy involving Murdoch failing a lie detector. And it was a part of his deal that he was supposed to come clean about everything. And the Fed said, no, he didn't come clean. He failed this, this uh, lie detector. And as a result, uh, you know what? Whatever deal we had has got to go out the window. So today was, was about a lot. It was about a lot. And it's, it's almost like a, is it though? Like, and I'm afraid to say this. I'm almost afraid to say this. Is it the final chapter of Alec Murdoch? Like, can we close the book on him? I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I'm not ready to get there just yet. But we're so much closer. And I feel like after today, he's, he's, he's not getting out. He's just not getting out. He will die behind bars. That's what I believe. Um, take a look at what happened today in the federal courthouse sentencing. Sentenced to 40 years in federal prison. Uh, federal agents recommended a sentence of 17 to 22. Will run concurrent to his 27-year state sentence. Ordered to pay $9 million in restitution. And what's important about the federal system, you generally do 85% of the time. Like, well, we, we cover cases around the country. Sometimes someone's sentenced to 20 years, and then we see, oh, they're getting out on parole in like 18 months? How does that work? Well, the way the federal system works for everybody else in the world is like 85% of the time. So um, he's going to be old, like, like, like old, like older than anyone I've ever seen, like walk out of a prison. And that's, that's all presupposing that somehow, some way he gets out from under the, you know, the double murder conviction, which we don't expect to happen. But just in case, this keeps him locked up anyway. Um, we have some quotes from the sentencing uh, that I'd like to read to you. Murdoch again apologized, saying he felt guilt, sorrow, shame, embarrassment, humiliation. He offered to, this is interesting, meet with the victims so they can say what they want to say and more closely inspect my sincerity. How about that? There's not enough time and I don't possess a sufficient vocabulary to adequately portray to you in words the magnitude of how I feel about the things I did. The U.S. Dist District Judge said he uh, sentenced Murdoch to a harsher punishment than suggested because he stole from the most needy, vulnerable people, including a client who became a quadriplegic after a crash, a state trooper who was injured on the job, and a trust fund intended for children whose parents were killed in a wreck. People who placed all their problems and all their hopes on him. Um, for those of you who don't remember the lies and the financial crimes of Alec Murdoch, we have a little reminder for you tonight. Take a listen. There were plenty of conversations where I looked people in the eye and I lied to them. There were plenty of times where I took money that I shouldn't have taken. There were plenty of times where I stole money. I can remember a lot of times where I lied to my clients, I misled my clients, and I stole money from my clients in conversations. And when you would talk to him, would you ask about the status of your case? Yes. And each time you talked to him, what did he say? Oh, it was making progress. When the defendant came to you, around the time of your mom's funeral and said he was going to help you and file a claim on your behalf. Why did you agree to that? Because I trusted him. Do you remember looking Tony Satterfield in the eye and lying to him? I remember lying to Tony Satterfield and I remember looking him in the eye on many occasions. And lying to him? Yeah. Lying to his family? I lied to his family. I don't know if I did it in person, but I know I had phone conversations with them where I lied to them. Every single client, I looked them in the eye, and I believed that the people that I stole money from for 
all those years trusted me. I'll go through whatever you want to go through, but each one of those clients is just what we've already talked about. Good people, fine people, upstanding people. They trusted me. Every single one of them, I did and I do still care about. And many of them, I love. I remain fully and wholeheartedly committed to finding a way to somehow make those who love me proud again in some small way. If he lives long enough, and he walks out of state court, and it's a consecutive sentence, he's gonna to walk to a federal prison. And I feel good that he will never breathe a fresh breath of air ever again. And you saw him there at the end. Let's bring in our special guest, the attorney who represented the Satterfield family, partner at Bland Richter, and host of the Cup of Justice podcast. He was in the courtroom today. Attorney Eric Bland is with us. Eric, uh, great to see you tonight. Thanks so much for joining us. Good to see you, Vinny. Appreciate you having me on. Let me start here. This is the thing that really jumped out to me. He wants to meet with the victims. Um, do you think he's going to meet with victims? Or are the folks you represent, the Satterfields, do they want to meet with, with Alec Murdoch? No, they don't. Um, they're very religious people. Uh, when they spoke with the court today, they turned around, they spoke to Alex. Uh, they also gave a press statement afterwards at the uh, press gathering and they said that they forgive Alex that they you know they're very religious and that they're they're they feel the scripture says that they're supposed to forgive and they have forgiveness in their heart both Tony Satterfield and Michelle Pickney uh, the mother of Hakeem Pickney the the quadriplegic who uh, Judge Gergel was talking about showed amazing grace Vinny about that they forgive Alex but they have no inclination or desire uh, to go meet with him. This was really a stunt that Alex was pulling uh, today. He, his attorney, Jim Griffin, said that um, he showed tremendous remorse and that he wanted to accept responsibility from the start and fully intended to. And I didn't get a chance to speak uh, today because the judge only wanted to hear from the victims. But I spoke to the press afterwards and I said, well, let's go, let's go down and see how he wanted to accept responsibility. He pled not guilty to the criminal charges. When my client sued him civilly, the Satterfields, he denied all obligations to them. In court, his attorney said that the Satterfields should look to others to get their money. After they negotiated a confession of judgment of him for $4.3 million, he tried to vacate that confession of judgment and said that he made a mistake and that he shouldn't have entered into it. He then tried to sue the Satterfields and bring them into a federal court civil case where Nautilus Insurance Company was suing Alex to get the $3.8 million that he stole from the Satterfields. Um, he then tried to uh, vacate the confession of judgment. He lost. He then tried to appeal that confession of judgment. He lost. He tried to put off the Satterfields criminal trial when he was being sued in state court criminally by trying to recuse uh, Judge Clifton Newman. And then he said that the jury pool was tainted. So these are just hollow words from his attorneys and Alex. He's a, you know, in the pantheon of career criminals, he's he's on Mount Rushmore, Vinny. And what he has done, really, because of the knowledge he has of our system, attempted to use any which way to mucky everything up and figure out a way out. Whatever in the moment would serve his purpose, he did. And then, as you described, tried to use the system again to undo it, uh, because at that point, uh, there, was a, there was something else that he needed, some, some other way out from under all of this. Um, let me ask you this question. Judge Gurgle today didn't give him that opportunity, Vic, uh, Vinny. Judge Gurgle today gave him uh, an additional 17 years above the 23 that he has to certainly serve in state court. He's 50 55 years old, so now we do the math. That takes him to 78. He would have to live essentially to almost 100 years old because he's going to get out of state prison if he can make it through maximum security prison. And this presupposes that the double murder charges get reversed. But Judge Gergel wanted to send a message 
that um, and he did it by uh, imposing a sentence that was one third greater than what the prosecution was asking for, Vinny. And he said that Alex Murdoch breached his plea agreement. He didn't accept uh, the lie detector test. He said he doesn't believe in it. He said, uh, I am enhancing his sentence, gave him an upward enhancement based on the fact that the people that he took advantage of were so vulnerable. The defense, Vinny, tried to say, well, Bernie Madoff, he stole money and you know he got essentially only 12 years because he he died in prison and then sam banks friedman he only got 25 years and he stole billions of dollars the difference is those people invested money in those investment schemes to try to make money the victims these victims in alex's case they relied on him they were in the worst times of their life. They lost loved ones. They needed medical bills paid. They had catastrophic injuries. And he exploited and stole from them. And Judge Gergel uh, didn't give him a break. And also exploited, like, the personal relationship he tried, you know, he, he forged with them. And I think so many of his clients and, and the victims here thought that, hey, I can trust this guy. He's got my back. And to me, that's another violation uh, of what he did. He took advantage of these uh, relationships and the trust that everyone put in him. Can, can we close the book tonight, Eric? Can we close the book on this guy? I think we can um, for a number of years until we have the appeals heard. There's going to be an appeal on the grounds of that the financial crimes were let in uh, into evidence by Judge Newman. That's going to be an issue, whether that was 404B, bad character evidence. Um, that's going to be a real ripe issue. And then, of course, the issue on denial of a motion for a new trial because of the alleged Becky Hill juror interference. Remember, Justice Toll applied the state standard, which said that you had to show that the jury was affected by what Becky Hill did or said that it influenced their verdict. The defense argued that there was a Supreme Court case, a United States Supreme Court case, that said all you have to show is that Becky Hill did more than just ministerial discussions with the jury about, you know, lunch and, and transportation. If she did discuss that Alex Murdoch was going to testify and you shouldn't believe him or watch him or any type of merit discussions, you're automatically determined to get a new trial. So I, I don't see him getting a reversal on our state level, but maybe on the federal level, if they decide that the court should have applied the federal standard. But that's, that's eight, nine years down the road. He has 23 years of a defined sentence. This was a 27 year sentence in state court, but it's 23 years, day for day, no chance of parole. And then you tack on these 17 years. Um, maybe he appeals Judge Gergel for the upward enhancement. But listen, Dick Harpelian wasn't in court today. That was a big, big statement for him not to be there today. I think we're going to, you know, let Alex do his time for a little bit. Look, he's like a rat. If you put him in a trap, he'll gnaw off his leg. He'll scheme to escape. And I think Judge Gergel tried to put him in a situation today that he could sit in his cell and scheme all he wants, but he's not getting out from these financial crimes. And hopefully, you know, the murder cases, they stick or there's a retrial, but he's in prison for the rest of his life. And that's where he belongs, Vinny. And that's the best news tonight. Eric Bland, great to have you on the program. Cup of Justice podcast. As a matter of fact, I'll, I'll, I'll be on the podcast coming up soon. So uh, everyone listen up for that. Yes, looking forward to having you on, Vinny. All right. Thanks so much, Eric. We'll see you again really, really soon. All right. So how does a lawyer break this bad? Like from where he was to where he is? We'll ask the think tank. Oh, yeah, they're here tonight. Al, Jennifer, Darnell. We are underway in the trial of doomsday prophet Chad Daybell. Prosecutors say they will seek the death penalty against him. Investigators have recovered human remains at Chad Daybell's residence. There's no way, Morgan, I should never come up with this. His wife, Lori Vallow Daybell, has already been convicted. Now, will her husband end up with the same fate? It's just so hard to know where the truth ends. 
It's the doomsday prophet, Chad Daybell, on trial. Life. And it's so unfortunate because you have such a lovely family of such friendly people, including you. And to go from that to this. Judge Newman describing it so well. To go from that to this. How do you do that? How do you break that bad as a lawyer? Take a look. Like you can just look at the pictures here. You can see, oh, out on the golf course with your Vinnie Vine shirt. Uh oh, now there's trouble. Now you're in court. Now you're a convicted murderer. How does this happen? I think the best way to capture the flavor is to take a look at Alec Murdoch, Breaking Bad. There's, there's six of us and one is missing. Okay, there's six, but one is missing. So six, do you guys have life jackets on? Yes, ma'am, we have, we have more than enough life jackets, but we're on the bank. So you're missing, who is missing? Uh, female, Mallory B. Other than being assaulted, has he received any direct threats? Related to the boat accident? Oh yes, all the time he Re gets recently. Um, yes, sir. I mean he gets them all the time. Okay. He gets them all the time. What's going on? I stop. I got a flat tire. Mm -hmm. And I stopped, and somebody stopped to help me. And when I turned my back, they tried to shoot me. Oh, okay. Were you shot? Yes, but I mean I'm okay. And after. You know, the starting of the withdrawals, I changed my plans. And, wh and what, what was the change in plans? Not to get pills from him anymore. And instead, I asked him to shoot me. I mean, I pulled up and I could see him. And, you know, I knew something was bad. I ran out. I knew it was really bad. <laughs> My, my boy over there, I could see it was. I'm so sorry. <clears throat> and I could see his brain on. <laughs> Did you kill Maggie? No. Did I kill my wife? Yes, sir. No, David. Do you know who did? No, I do not know who did. Did you kill Paul? No, I did not kill Paul. Do you know who did? No, sir, I do not know who did. We will try this case in January, come hell or high water. Ride by here at 11 or 12 o'clock at night, you're going to see the lights on. We're not going to let this slip by because they're dragging their feet. This has been a long, exhaustive investigation. And it's going to be a fairly long trial because it's complicated. It's a journey. There's a lot of aspects to this case. There's a lot of factors to this case. But like a lot of things that are complicated, when you start to put them all together, piece them together like a puzzle, all of a sudden the picture emerges and it's really simple. Because you see, they decided that night, he did it. Without forensics, without cell phones, without any of that. And they've been pounding that square peg in the round hole for the last, well, since, uh, you know, since uh, June of 2021. If you decide to testify, you'll be subject to the same rules that govern other witnesses and you may be examined and cross-examined on any relevant issue in this case. Have you made a decision as to whether you're going to testify? Yes, sir. All right, then what is your decision? I am going to testify. I want to testify. All right, very well. Thank you. Maybe maybe a, a, a thousand or, or maybe a thousand milligrams or, or, or 1,200 milligrams on a day I didn't take as much or didn't have as much up to i mean their days many days a lot of days most days were more than that and many days would be you know 20 more than 2,000 milligrams a day do you love paul did i love him 
<laughs> like no other. He and Buster. Do you love Maggie? More than anything. I love Maggie from the first time we went out. Did you kill Maggie? No, I did not kill Maggie. I did not kill Paul. I would never hurt Maggie, and I would never hurt Paul, ever, under any circumstances. Verdict, guilty, signed by the foreperson of the jury, date 3-2-23. What we had filed today, it, it, supported by sworn testimony of jurors, is that the clerk of court had improper private communications with the jurors, and the subject matter the subject matter of those communications was the credibility of the defense that the Murdoch legal defense team put up, and it was the believability of the defendant's own testimony. I do not feel that I abuse my discretion when I find the defendant's motion for a new trial on the factual record before me must be denied, and it is so ordered. I agree that I... Uh, I wrongly took all of that money, Your Honor, and did all of those crimes. I disagree with some of the narrative, but not the essential elements of the, of the facts of the crimes. I do you believe that if you are to proceed uh, with a jury trial on these charges that you would be found guilty? I am guilty, and yes, sir, I, I believe that I would be found guilty. Oh, of course you would. Of course you would. How does someone break this bad? Let's bring in our think tank. Joining us tonight in Englewood Cliffs, New Jersey, criminal defense attorney, former prosecutor Al Wunsch III. Also with us in Stanford, Connecticut, criminal defense attorney Darnell Crossland. And in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, family law attorney Jennifer Brandt. Al, I'll begin with you. How does someone break that bad? I, this is just, it's, it's just heinous it really is i mean and the tragedy out of all this is that you know he actually did a very good job for these people i mean he got great numbers on these cases millions of dollars for these victims and then he pocketed them and then i mean it wasn't enough for him to get his third or whatever the the agreement was with regards to his retainer he took the money from the most needy and the most desperate people and it's just like, and he gave him nothing now it's no not like he like said oh yeah we settled for 50 grand here take this money and he he gives right. him nothing and nothing. and that and that's why and that's why the 40 years is is still not enough I mean, as far as i'm concerned if you're an attorney and you violate that trust okay i have no mercy for you throw the book away throw it throw the keys away you are not getting out of jail you have destroyed people's lives they come to you at the most vulnerable moments of their lives, and they entrust you with that vulnerability. And you take that on, and you have a sacred bond and a secret vow that you've got to be able to do what you need to do in this case, and their cases, and then you violate that, no mercy whatsoever. He got, this, this guy just got wrapped up in his own, just his just heinous ability to have to have everything. Okay, I mean, it's just the hubris of this man is just disgusting. So, Darnell, how does someone who enters the world of law, right? We've all, we've all, we all went to law school. We all took the bar. We learned about it. We understand ethics. We took ethics. How do you go from being a lawyer, helping uh, people who've been damaged, to someone who rips off all your clients, rips off your law partners, and then kills your family. Like, how do you go from point A to point B? Thought you were gonna give me a break, Vinny. You had to throw in the kill your family part. Yeah, I'll skip that part, um, so I'm throwing it in. Exactly, so, I, so the, the first part, um, I can tell you that uh, I could condemn the behavior and save you the, the Sunday, uh, Sunday sermon that Al gave, um, because I, I'm not attached to it that deeply. Um, and the reason why, is because I can condemn the behavior, but I'm a very, very staunch supporter that of the idea that people are all humans. Um, and so police officer, judges, uh, host of court TV, closing arguments, Billy Politan, all of us are all human. So if we believe that, that this gentleman had a drug addiction, just like anybody else, oh. I'm, not of the, I'm not of the mindset that you can let some people in some careers um, uh, 
you know, have this idea that they're, they're drug addicted and this is why this happened and give them help. But then other people, you they don't. And so I, I do understand it's a great responsibility of ours. And if this was a Madoff where he didn't have a drug addiction, and he was just ripping people off, then I can give you the Al, Al once Sunday sermon. But if he's really sick and it's not for us to say that he Reverend wasn't, Al. then I can't, I, I can't give you that sermon. Reverend Al. Um, All right. Uh, Sister Jennifer, um, <laughs> look, do you believe it was just these opioids that drove all of this, or is there something else that made Alec Murdoch break so bad? It, it wasn't just the drugs, Vinny. It was his hubris, like you said before, his ego. He thought he could get away with it. He's greedy. A lot of people are greedy. And he was very, very greedy. Um, and so he came from a long line of, of family members who did, you know, they just ruled the, the roost down there. And he thought he was above the law. So he took advantage. Um, and that's, that's what happened. The drugs, you know, fueled his fire. That's what I would say. Um, but he, it's just pure greed. All right, folks, here's the good news. The whole choir will be with us the entire hour. Al Wunsch, Darnell Crossland, Jennifer Brandt.